about the clinical applications of MRI. And it would be nice to understand uh, what's very quickly that uh, I'm sure I've shown this slide before. But we are limited by what we see. Okay? If you cannot see something, most likely sometimes you will not be able to tell me what it is. Although people have enhanced their abilities, you know, by feeling. But in imaging, if you use a proper tool, you'll be able to make the appropriate diagnosis. And um, there are several tools in imaging, and uh, like I've said before, MRI happens to be like the top of the line. And it has several applications. It has several applications that have been used and are still being used and more are being developed every, when I say now, every minute. Every minute something new is coming out. And one has to keep itself updated. So we're going to focus on the brain. I will show you some clinical images. And then we'll look at it and then we can interact or we'll allow you to ask questions and things like that. Okay? So um, this is the image of the brain. And uh, those of you who are not familiar with brain images, everybody, most people at least, will be able to make a diagnosis from something like that. I've seen a brain before. If I ask you, this, this brain, is it normal or abnormal? If anybody knows the answer, just raise your hand. You think it's normal or abnormal? Who, are, who's, who, are, who say it's normal? Okay, we all agree it's abnormal. Beautiful. So, that's the first question a radiologist asks. Now, second question is where or which side is abnormal? Because the brain actually is a mirror copy of itself. You know, the right equals technically the right side equals the left, and the right side should always equal the left. You have two hemispheres that form the cerebral or the brain itself. The cerebral hemispheres are two. Even the cerebellar hemispheres are also two. So they are mirror copies of each other. If you slice the brain in half, you will get a replica of itself. So the second question you want to ask is which side is abnormal? Okay? The left side. Yes. Okay, beautiful. So the left side. And most of you know that usually when we're looking at images, we look at our images, we assume that the image or the patient is actually facing us. So when you look here, you know, at this patient now is facing us. Okay? I think it's facing us. So this side is the left, and this side is the right. Even though what I told you is like this, this is the right. And this is what we left. But we assume the patient is facing us. All images are presented as the anatomical way images are presented. All images, you assume the patient is looking at you. So his left side is your right side. So this is an image and this shows what that the abnormality is on the left. Now, the third question you want to ask as a radiologist or as anybody who is in imaging is what is the abnormality? Okay, so those are the kind of questions we ask. So you break it down like that. What is it? Or we said it's image of the left now. Now, the brain of the host is divided in several um, segments. You know, you have the frontal lobe, you have the temporal lobe, you have the ventral lobe, and you have the occipital lobe. So usually we say, okay, which lobe is affected? Or where is the lesion? So if you look at this lesion now, where do you think this lesion is? Okay, not on anatomy, but basically this, this region looks as if it's in the mid portion of the brain, like the frontal and parietal region. Okay? The, third, the fourth question sometimes want to ask, is it in is it within the brain or is it coming from outside the brain? So these are the kind of questions we ask in radiology to be able to classify is actually what radiology does that MRI helps us to do is to characterize lesions appropriately for diagnosis. Now this is a case of a what? Of a meningioma, which is a brain tumor. Okay, it's usually a huge brain tumor and all that. And usually these tumors usually grow from what? 
outside the brain of recovery of the meninges that covers the brain and they can push. You know, they grow and they can infiltrate, not necessarily infiltrate, but they can, they can compress or displace the brain. When you see a vision like this, you see as if it's, you know, it appears as if it's inside the brain, but it's actually left inside the brain. It has, it has grown so much that it has pushed the brain. Such. Now, we use different what? Sequences or different, different uh, parameters, MRI parameters to characterize the brain. And so these are the locations. So you must sometimes define where the location is and all that. Okay? So we use different MRI parameters to define where what lesions we are dealing with and how the lesions you know, react with the MRI signals that we are sending. And that's why you have what you call T1 and you have T2. And then you have other sequences, other more complex sequences, but the basic sequences is what? A T1 weighted image and a T2 weighted image. Now, what is a T1 weighted image? A T1 weighted image, basically, clinically, if you see a T1 weighted image, usually the area of the CSF, the area of the CSF appears what? Appears white, appears dark. CSF. And that's where you look for CSF. Where do you find CSF in the brain? You find it in the ventricles. Pointer. So, where are the ventricles? These are the ventricles. Okay? So these are the ventricles. So on the T1 weighted image, you will find that this ventricles, this is the T1 weighted image, and this is the T2 weighted image. The ventricles on T1, where the CSF is not necessarily the ventricles, where CSF is anywhere in the brain, on the T1 weighted image, it's the basic uh, sequence. The CSF will appear dark. Now, a T2 weighted image. It's also a little image that is based on the timing that you, you pick your signal. On the T2 weighted image, the CSF will appear white. So that's how you know which sequence you are dealing with. Alright? Now, so usually the T2 weighted image shows CSF as white. As a classic display. So most lesions also. Apart from CSF being white and uh, appearing white on, on the T2 and appearing dark on T1, not other tissues also appear white on T1 and T2 weighted images. Okay? So if you look at if you look at this image, you find that this error is what? The CSF, which is what? And the CSF, which is dark. Here, you have the CSF, here is dark, CSF is white, okay? But apart from just looking at the, the, the tissues themselves, you have this image that is also that is white here, in the team of the image. This area is white, okay? This area is white, contains what? It contains fat. It contains fat. So, fat, usually, Okay, on T1 weighted image will also appear white. That is another thing we also need to uh, be conversant with. The other thing we also need to know is that lesions, okay, um, blood vessels, blood vessels that have fluid within them usually will not show any signal. Anything that is moving usually will not show any signal. Okay, now there are certain sequences that also can be modified apart from T1 and T2. So you can have sequence with what you call like a what you call flare. Flare is what is a fluid attenuated combustion recovery image. In those kind of sequences, what happens is that when normally you will have a T2 weighted image that will show you CSF as white, you now what you call do an inversion because usually the contrast of T2 weighted images are usually better. So you can now flip the signal that would normally give you a white CSL and make it dark and every other tissue contrast will move. And when you do that, you get a flare image. Here you have um, a lesion. Okay? This lesion is within the brain. On a, okay. So this is a flare image. 
If you see, if you look very closely, you can see that the margins, the vertical areas are wider. Okay? And then you can see, you know, this area appears very irregular and wide. And then the CSF here is what? Is dark. But this is actually a T2 flare image where you have flipped in something. But here you have here you have a contrast image. Okay, that you are given like T1 that you have enhanced. You have enhanced and given contrast. So you will see a blush here of T1. So these are the kind of parameters or characteristics that we, we use to you know look at uh, visions or images. Now there's another pattern, okay, or that parameter, or that sequence that you can use, which is called you know DWI. A DWI is what it means what? It's a diffusion weighted image. In the diffusion weighted image, what you are looking at, you're not just looking at uh, the timing of the sequence, but you are looking at how water moves from one compartment to the other. And that's called diffusion weighted. You're looking for the, how water moves from one part to the other. And in this case, what happens is that you assume Water normally moves in an enemy space abnormally. If you pour water here, it just moves in any direction. So the signal usually you know, does not give any, uh, usually because it's moving in that direction. Okay? You know, it usually will not give the, the, what do you call it, the machine or the system that you are in that sequence is made so that it, it does not give any signal because it's, it's, it's in motion. Now, when you have an abnormality that obstructs the motion of water, the movement of water, you understand? On a DWI image or a diffusion weighted image, the settings are put in such a way that when water motion, motion is obstructed or is restricted, it will give you a high signal. Like I said, these are the sequences that we use in MRI. You can, there are several sequences you manipulate that to be able to give you an image. So, what we want basically people like uh, Serum and other things that they use to the, manipulate the, the reaction of tissues to signal. And DWI is one of the manipulations that you want to show in DWI. What you're looking for is what you're looking for restriction of water. You understand? And usually, what happens is that when cells, when cells are dead, okay, when cells die, they usually lose what you call the ability. To, to, to maintain motion movement of water from one compartment to the other. And when they fail that, because there's a, there's a membrane that covers the cells, when that mechanism of protecting keeping cells in and out, once it's broken down, water can move freely into the cell. And when water moves freely into the cell, okay, you have what the cells will swell. When the cells swell, the normal, the normal compartment of extracellular fluid that is outside the cell, the ability of them to move between the cells becomes what? Less. And when that happens, that's what you call as a rest what called restricted diffusion. Now, the other thing, the other sequence which you also need to know is that you, you can actually calculate how much of restriction of water, you know, that means that is restricted, that is restricted. That's what we call the use what we call the ADC, apparent diffusion coefficient. You can calculate the amount of restriction that is going on. And when you calculate that, you can now actually see whether that restriction you see, the white image you see usually, if it's actually real or not. Usually on an ADC, when it is right here, normally the ADC will give you a black space. Once you see something like that, then you come that actually is a true restriction. Okay, those are the parameters we use. Okay? The other parameters you can also look at is what you can do what you call like a perfusion. Perfusion. These are the kind of sequences. Perfusion means that you want to see the amount of blood that's flowing into a particular region. Right? So you can do some sequences that can show you actually how blood flows huh, within the region. And that can help you to demonstrate how much blood is flowing into a particular region. And in cases like this, when you have like this are case of a, of a tumor. So in that way, you are able to demonstrate characteristics of lesions. And because we know that lesions or masses or tumors behave in different ways, we use all these sequences to characterize them and get diagnosis. So if you see something that is giving a particular way, just like you see 
If you see a man, you know, if you see a lady walking like this, you know, <laughs> that is the way a man normally walks. Is that not so? So you will say, that is a man. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, if you take a closer look, even when the person, even when the person is walking like a man, you now look close, you now find that the person has long hair. It is unusual, it's not common for men to have long hair. Do you understand? Then you say, ah, sorry. Even though this man is walking like a man, or this person is walking like a man, he has long hair. Could it be a man? Well, you could not start to question it. Then if you look closely again, you find out that this person that is walking has breasts. <laughs> yeah. Do you understand? He has breasts. So you know say this person is walking like a man. He has long hair that looks like a woman. More so, he has breasts. So possibly this may not be a man. It may be a woman. Is that not so? So that's what the geology does. So you look at characteristics. You say, oh, but most likely because some men also have breasts. <laughs> Some men are how what you call it, some men they are chubby. You look at them, sometimes you can see they have bread. So you need to wonder. So sometimes it comes to so you, you understand. So that's what the geology does. So what we do now, we look at other sequence. Are you getting it? Yes. You're not, you're not really sure. The person is working like a man, has one hair, which would be a woman, but men also have one hair. In other words, some men. You know that you don't see. So, you want to quickly call him, call him, call him towards a man. We oh, are yeah, the now. I don't know. Wait. There's breast. So naturally, you should say what? It's a woman. But you also think, come on. There are some other men that have breasts. So you are worried. So you look for your other sequence, another thing to do. What should you do to actually truly convince yourself that this is a man or a woman? What else can you do? You don't have another sequence, not also. So what do you do? Huh? What? You compare with something else. Huh? You compare? Who knows the answer? Something might be. No, also think something is wrong somewhere now. You want to, you want to do another test to confirm the gender. You look for the very sequence. You look for what? Very sequence. Base. Base. Voice. Voice. Yes. Okay, beautiful. That is one way. So you call the person. Ah, gentlemen. Oh, hello. <laughs> How are you? Are you doing well? The person that looks at you. I'm doing very well. More <laughs> 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 yeah, confusion. The person is working like a man. He has breast, he has long hair, and he speaks like a man. But after you have breasts, you are speaking like a man. You understand? So you look for another test to do. So you are done another test now. You are done another one more thing like a voice test. You have changed the voice. But some women also have deep voice. Yes. So there's a confusion. So you do another test. And that's what MRI does for us. You understand? Some, some things are straightforward. Some are not straightforward. So you do sequences, do this sequence, do T1, do T2, do, 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 do flare, do proton density, do fat restriction, do, you understand, do gradient echo. So you just self MRI has and it helps you to put all those things together. In this case, one of the tests you can do is to say, okay, is to find a way and maybe possibly if you have, okay, in this case, call the person aside and strip the person. <laughs> so look, I'm sorry, you are confusing me too much. You strip the person of, of the clothes. Yes. And you look at what? The genitals. Yes. Gold standard. Gold standard. <laughs> eh? Look at the genitals. Then you are not sure whether it's this like a man or whether it's this like you ask and look. At least, whatever it is, you have, you have the genital of a woman. Or you have the genital of a man. What about the situation whereby there's no pleasure of having me? There's confusion with the genital and it's not having both male and So this is not a rare condition now. So you see, she has one, it's another area. So you go, so first, that is very rare also. But at least when you look at the genitals, 
almost restricted. So that's what imaging does. Imaging helps us to be able to look at you know, something that looks like something we're able to evaluate with something else. Now, one of the things like I can take a strip to woman or the man or whatever and see the genitals. I want imaging or sometimes I use another material like contrast. We use the contrast material, you know, an extra, you know, and give what? And give an intravenous contrast, which is in this case in the MRI research called gadolinium. Now, gadolinium has a way of interacting with the signals, with the MRI signals, and then shooting signal and produce areas where the gadolinium what? Concentrates in terms of blood perfusion, in terms of you know uh, the disruption of the blood brain barrier, and areas where there are disruption of the blood brain barrier, where there is more concentration, the signals will appear brighter because that that they do not what is like you know has a sensitivity to like iron or iron like uh, reaction. So when you do that, it tells you that this if the lesion you are dealing with, which you don't understand initially, it helps you to what gives you a more deeper characteristics. Do you understand? So we use contrast images sometimes, most times, to be able to understand the characteristics of vision. Like in this case now, you have what's called uh, a GBM. GBM is the most ugliest, the most deadliest brain tumor you can have. And sometimes it can mimic simple tumors. You know, sometimes it can look at like sixty tumors or something like that. So you look at the top of that characteristics you look at. So the two unique visions that you can see here now, you have this vision here, you have this. So this one, if you look closely, is what? What the what sequence is this? T2, T2, T2. Because what you have what? You look at the CSF. Always look at the CSF thing here. Once you see CSF is white, it's T2. One of the terminologies you use for CSF is ah, when you say World War II. So you know, water is white on T2. You know? So when you see something like you say T2, so this is a T2 different image. This side is abnormal. You know that this is an abnormal side. And then we know that there's a lot of some whiteness here. This whiteness here represents what? Fluid. And also there's a picture of water inside. Okay? So this one is now what? This is a T1 weighted image. But this T1 weighted image, you know, where CSF is dark. So that means what is the knowledge around this here is what? Compared to the there's water here. This is the area is the system area. And then we give contrast. This contrast helps you to delineate, you know, the margin of the tube. We show you whether it's a regular, whether it's homogeneous or things like that. So we use, we use contrast agent to be able to delineate uh, lesions. Now, the other thing sometimes, MRI will not sometimes help you answer all the questions and they keep doing all that. So that's another test you can do. You can even do a CT because you can do the uh, this thing. And in our own case, as clinicians, you can also do what you call like a geography, conventional angiography. You can do MRI angiography. You want to look at the characteristics of tumors and all that. So MRI has several of these applications that is what is being used. What you have here, you have this abnormal tumor that is present on the midline. And then here, you have what, what you want to look at. You want to be able to know how the vessels operate here. And that's what we do. This is not MRI. This is a new drug, you know, what you call, um, where you inject contrast now into the body and actually see how the cell, how the vessels operate in that region are operating. And what we have here, you have that is extra. Normally here, you can see there's nothing here. Okay? This is possible. You can focus on this side and you see all these vessels. You see here, there's a cluster of vessels. That means there's a tumor there that is highly vascular. So these are the various things that, um, that can be done. The other thing I want to say is that, you know, um, you can have, don't worry about the terminologies and things like that. I just want to just show you. Uh, you can have what you call, uh, so that's, this, this is an imaging technique. This MRI or CT is a CT image. Okay. Now, one of the things, the drawbacks usually of MRI is that it has the tendency not to be able to demonstrate the bone because there are no signals. All the cells, all the hydrogen nuclei within the cells are tightly packed. So you cannot pick any signal from bone in MRI. So MRI, usually bone usually appears dark on MRI normally. Anyway, it's dark. So when there's bone, it's dark. Blood is also dark. Vessels are dark. 
So it's very difficult to demonstrate or you know, see bones. So when they're not sure, I want to look at the bony anatomy of a particular lesion, they do, they do um, a CT. Because sometimes calcifications as well. We have calcifications within tumors and stuff like that. It's difficult to see whether these are calcifications or how these are what? Or these are, uh, what do you call it, hemorrhages. Because all those things appear the same color, they appear that on MRI. So sometimes we need to do CT to actually you know, corroborate our suspicion of lesions. Okay? The other thing you need to do, you know, um, okay, let me leave this one. I'm going to talk about this. I talked about, uh, what do you call it? The ability to do um, using contrast and things like that. Okay? So, sequences help us, different sequences help us to look at images. All right? So, what I was telling you about CT and MRI now. So, you see here, this edition. This is what is a CT. And this is what? MRI. So, in this case, we see a lesion here. A lesion here, which is white and bone. But here, you see the same lesion. We see, of course, the tumor and all that. But we can't make out you know, what is going on there. And this is a case for the tumor that usually has a calcific tendencies. And because we cannot make out what is on this side, we usually do what? If you have a CT and look at actually character, that this is a tumor that has calcification within it. And most likely, 90% of molecular dendritic cryomas are calcified. So we are easily to put the two together. So CT or MRI sometimes work with their complementary tests. In, its, in, the, in the cell. But in terms of soft tissue demonstration, the, 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 the MRI stands out. Okay? So these are the various, these are various uh, pathologies that you can, you, know, you can see in MRI. These are brain tumors. So it's not just that different kinds of tumors. It's possibly a hundred thousand, even about a thousand different types of tumors you can demonstrate in the brain. So I'm going to use MRI to, to class, use soft classify them based on their tissue characteristics or tissue interaction with uh, the sequences that we apply to them or the extra, you know, the, 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 the what do you call the contrast, how they react to contrast and things like that. So basically, these are the kind of parameters that MRI helps us to do. And MRI is very good with that. Apart from just taking MRI, using cover classifications and things like that, we can also do several other sequences, okay? Now, the sequences that we do, you can also do those, not structural sequences, but you can also do some chemical things where you can look at metabolites. And you want to look at metabolites. What, what are these tumors? What are these tumors? What do they contain? So we can do MRI spectroscopy. So MRI spectroscopy helps us to be able to, you know, take a point and look at the what? The metabolites. You know, practice we can make. But I, I think um, Abdul mentioned some of in his, in his test. You can, have, you can look at differences of the ratio of some of these metabolites. And that helps us to what? To be able to further characterize tumors. Because sometimes tumors can look alike. And we're not able to know how it is um, benign or malignant. So spectroscopy can help you because the parameters, the ratio of, of malignant tumors in certain of these metabolites are different. So spectroscopy can tell you, give you an idea of the various uh, tissue uh, co uh, components. So apart from that, you look at, you know, so we can look at the enhancement of tissues, we can look at the shape of tissues, we can look at the, you know, uh, the constituents of tissues with MRI. And the beauty about MRI is that sometimes you can do certain tests that helps you to work, to be able to correlate with the genetic Markers, the genetic, genetic, genetic markers in patients. So, so there are several tumors, but like I said, if you look at like, you need to also look at several parameters to be able to tell where they are. Okay? So, in terms of um, spectroscopy, here we have <coughs> demonstrations using different techniques, and you can, here you can see different techniques, putting all these things together, looking at the spectroscopic differences. Of this, uh, of this kind of visions. 
So, with MRI as well, not just looking at the brain now, you can also do what you call, you can also extend your, your spread of your evaluation. You can evaluate the brain, you can also evaluate the spine at the same time. So, some visions will tend to spread beyond the brain into the spine. And such visions, such spread, or they can spread within the CSF, they can spread even within the tumor itself into, uh, into certain areas. And MRI can help you to answer those questions. And MRI is not just for the brain alone, you can also use MRI basically for every other part of the body. You can use MRI to study what? The bones, even bones lesions, where they use the appropriate sequences. Then you use MRI to study the lungs using the appropriate sequences, even though the interaction, you know, what I heard yesterday, sometimes the, the air usually constitutes like an artifact. We can also use it manipulating the sequences we can use, we can also look at it as those, uh, those things. So yeah, actually MRI helps us in terms of manipulating and using several manipulation of sequences to evaluate tumors. Okay, I think basically, basically uh, that's just what we want to talk about in terms of how we can use MRI to evaluate lesions.